I've drafted over 100 fantasy teams this offseason, uh, most of them on Underdog Fantasy, where they are paid leagues. And the best part about Underdog is they track your exposure to every single player. So the exposure numbers that I'm talking about in this video, when I say I have 0% exposure, I've done about 50 drafts on Underdog. Some of them are tournament style, uh, you know, where you're entering for $5. The grand prize winner is like $40,000. Some of them are just normal $3 drafts. But it's a total of about 50 drafts right now. So the exposure here is a, is a wide volume of drafts for me not to have picked these players at any point. Last week, we did a video highlighting the 10 players that I have the highest exposure to, the most percentage of times I've drafted a single player. Today, we're doing the opposite. I'm talking through 13 players that I have 0% exposure to. I have not drafted a single time. And some of these players, it was pretty hard to believe that they were actually on this list, but I'm going to talk through my thought process. I'm going to talk through where they're being drafted in those drafts and why I've been avoiding them up to this point. If you missed the video from last week where I talked about my 10 most drafted players, we will link that down below. Make sure you check that out afterwards. But today, today we're talking. And we are not eating, I guess. <laughs> We're going to go position by position here and atop the list. And this was one of the more surprising names on the list was Brock Purdy, the San Francisco 49ers QB by all accounts, a breakout year last year. When I look at the quarterback position as a whole, uh, these underdog drafts are one quarterback drafts. So, you know, we're looking for obviously high upside players. We're looking for guys that'll kind of break the slate. So I draft a lot of like the Jalen Hurts is the Kyler Murray's those types of mid round players. Jared Goff, for me, he's in a tier where it's like Trevor Lawrence and Tua and Jared Goff. And Brock Purdy is the highest drafted one of those guys. So when you look at the ADP, he's five picks ahead of Trevor Lawrence. He is 11 picks ahead of Tua. He is 13 picks ahead of Jared Goff. When I look at the outlooks of all those players, I look at good teams. I look at a really high floor. I look at good weapons around them. So I don't necessarily have a preference of Brock Purdy going ahead of those four quarterbacks. So typically, if I'm looking to draft a quarterback in that range, the high floor, you know, good arm, good talent, good weapon, good offense QBs, I am just allowing the latest of that tier to drop down to me. So Brock was the first quarterback. The second quarterback was Geno Smith. And this one was equally surprising because I just – I have a, a, a ton of DK Metcalf. I have a ton of Tyler Lockett. I have a ton of Jackson Smith and Jigba. And typically, I'm trying to stack QBs with the weapons in these drafts. I think a lot of what this came down to was I haven't really waited on quarterback. I'm not going late round quarterback. So if you guys are unfamiliar with underdog fantasy, the way it works is it's it's a best ball leagues, which means you don't manage your roster in season. You don't make sit start decisions. You don't do waiver wire. You don't do trades or anything. You just draft a very big team in the summer. So it's 18 rounds with no kickers or defense. So it's only skilled position players. So typically you're drafting two, if not three quarterbacks, two, if not three tight ends, you're only starting one quarterback, one tight end, two running backs, three wide receivers and a flex. And the way they decide who starts is the software automatically starts each week, the best, you know, three wide receivers that perform that week into your starting lineup. So again, best ball it's like if you've ever played in golf you play best ball so it's the same way so you are drafting quarterbacks that are quarterback 20 25 29 despite it being a one qb league but with geno smith as i said like i'm typically targeting a jalen hurts or a mahomes in the fourth fifth round or a Kyler in the seventh round and then i am usually grabbing my quarterback too that is the latest of the purdy goff t law even like caleb williams ish here at this point and then I'm typically fading the late round quarterbacks because I think there are a lot of high upside players that you can draft at that point in the draft right 16th 17th 18th round where I'm looking at guys like you know the Michael Wilsons or the Jalen Polks or the or the Tyrone Tracy's or guys that I think can break out as rookies or younger players that I think have a lot of upside and I'd rather have them than quarterbacks and Gino's you know banged up he's missed a lot of camp already with multiple injuries he's got a hip injury going on right now so I am I'm okay fading him right now the last quarterback up on this list is Russell Wilson. Now, I've been pretty adamant that, I've, that I'm high on the Steelers offense, and it's mostly because the offense is very condensed. I think it's just going to be George Pickens, Pat Fryermuth, and then the running backs. I think it's those four players pretty much getting the ball on every single play. But this is not going to be a high passing volume offense, so I don't think Russ is going to have a ton of statistics behind him. I don't really see the upside in drafting a quarterback who's on a short leash, like Justin Fields might get on the field this year. Uh, this is going to be a run-first offense that only has one real 
outside weapon in George Pickens. So I'm, I'm, I'm fading Russell Wilson despite liking the weapons on the team because it is relatively condensed. The first running back on this list is Nick Chubb. You've heard me yap about him continuously throughout the summer. And I feel really fucking good about where my stance has been all summer because when drafts first started, he was an eighth, ninth round pick. He was going in like the 90s, his ADP. It's moved all the way back to 128 at this point. So you're talking about a 10th, 11th round pick. And I'm still not even comfortable getting there. Nick Chubb, I would I would be surprised if he doesn't start on the pup. He's coming back from major, major knee injury, reconstruction. He tore multiple ligaments in there, which means you got to have surgery on the first ligament, let that repair, then get to the ACL. So, like, sure, it happened early on in the season, but he didn't actually get to repair his ACL until weeks, if not months later. So this is a long recovery for a player that's turning 29 years old this year. I am. I feel like people are talking about his upside. I'm trying to be more practical here. This is the point I need to make with both him and the next player up on this list, Jonathan Brooks. Fantasy, in fantasy football, injuries are going to find you, all right? Injuries are going to plague your team. They're going to plague the entire NFL. Why are we actively choosing to draft players that are injured? Why are we going out of our way to say, yep, you know, I know injuries are going to hit my other guys, but let me just fucking take an injured guy also. Like, there's no reason for fake injury optimism. Stop drafting players that you already know are injured. We already know they're fucking injured. Stop drafting them, all right? So Nick Chubb is there. Jonathan Brooks is there. Jonathan Brooks, another dude who's now finally started to actively fall down draft boards because the Panthers came out and said he probably won't be ready until week three or four, which probably points to him also being on the pup list. He is a, a torn ACL victim in late November, had surgery early December, uh, a rookie, 20 years old, in a bad offense right now. Not a lot of scoring upside. No reason to rush this kid whatsoever. Uh, I don't expect a major impact from Brooks this year at all. So again, these guys both have to drop down dramatically in the ADP for me to even look their way. So all this like hypothetical, theoretical upside they have, I think where they're going in drafts, one should be pushed down further, but is where they should be going in drafts. The market is the market is the market. Stop drafting injured fucking players and stop drafting Devin Singletary. When I look at Devin Singletary, the Giants signed him to be like their, you know, their top running back. But the situation, there's just no upside here. He's going around those picks where it's like Tony Pollard, Chase Brown, Zach Moss. And I'd like I take those guys over him a million times over. The Giants offense has so little upside. It's a very bad offensive line. He's not good enough to hold off players of like Tyrone Tracy's talent for the entire season. All right. So Tyrone Tracy is one of my favorite sleepers. When I People making a mockery of Eric Gray after the first preseason game. Eric Gray's fine. He's mid. He's he, he is what he is. He's whatever. He'll make the roster probably, but he was doing the preseason week one shenanigans against like third string defensive players. So uh, I think it's Tyrone Tracy open season on on Devin Singletary. It's just there's just no upside in that situation. So I am I am out on Devin Singletary. I am also out on Gus Edwards. He is the last running back on this list. Also going in that same range where you're picking between him and you're picking between the Chase Browns and the Zach Mosses and Tajay Spears and uh, you know, maybe Tony Pollard. Like I would 1000% rather have those guys. Like Gus Edwards is just a very uninspiring pick to me. He has missed like all of training camp so far with some undisclosed injury. I don't know what's going on in LA. Like they don't have any running backs healthy. I don't think he's practiced. JK Dobbins is barely practicing. Kamani Vidal is not practicing. Like, I don't know who is going to be the running back there. This is the first time Gus Edwards, one, he's he's old now, okay? And he's had a lot of wear and tear. He's had scar tissue build up uh, on his lower body because he's had some serious injuries over the last few years. This is the first time he's not going to be running behind Lamar Jackson. Everybody is crazy efficient behind Lamar Jackson. Everybody plays well behind Lamar Jackson. He is now in LA behind a hobbled Justin Herbert who's dealing with a plantar fasciitis injury that's going to linger all season. Gus Edwards is not a big playmaker. He's not breaking off chunk plays. Uh, he doesn't catch passes. I don't think this offense will run a lot of plays. I think they'll be relatively slow. I don't think they're going to be high scoring. This feels like the most obvious, like, stay away. You're going to be doing a million sit-start decisions. Like, should I start Gus Edwards as my second flex this year? And then everyone's just going to be like, oh, well, he's got a 40% chance to score a touchdown and probably 40 yards this week. So it, it just, just, just stay away from Gus Edwards. And I just want to throw this out there. If you're not drafting on underdog, you're missing a huge opportunity to get ready for your home leagues because you do a bunch of these drafts and then these picks become muscle memory. I know that I'm fading certain players at certain picks, but because I do so many of these drafts, if I see them fall 
to the third, fourth round, whatever, I know they're an auto pick there. I might not like them here, but I love them here. And I get that practice on underdog fantasy. So if you want to start drafting high volume teams and start to see your exposure to players, the easiest way to do that, actually the only way to do it in the industry is on underdog fantasy. The best part about signing up on underdog fantasy is when you use our code BDGE, deposit 10 bucks, you're going to get a deposit bonus up to $250, depending on how much you drop on the platform. You'll be able to do drafts with us all summer. We're dropping links in the Discord to draft with us, everybody in the office, etc. Plus, you are getting our fantasy football draft guide absolutely free when you deposit on Underdog Fantasy, all right? So if nothing else, you get the draft guide, you get a free square of Lamar Jackson, half a passing yard in week one. You get to track your exposure. You get to do best ball drafts. You get to stay on top and prep throughout the entire summer on Underdog Fantasy. Go download the app and I'll see you on there. Moving over to the wide receiver position and the moment you have all been waiting for based on the thumbnail, most likely. This one kind of blew blew the brakes off here, okay? I have drafted Drake London of my Atlanta Falcons zero times this year. Or let me let me dive into this a little bit because a lot of you guys are gonna be like, ah, oh, whatever, okay? On underdog fantasy, you need to take him at the one-two turn. If you are the the 202 or the 203, you can't get him past that. His ADP right now is like 14.5. He is the 14th pick right now overall in fantasy football. That is crazy. If he is a late second round pick in your home leagues, if you're like a normal person that does normal leagues where you're drafting on ESPN or Yahoo or NFL or whatever, Drake London's going to end up being a late second, maybe even third round pick. I love that for you. All right. I'm happy for you. I think that is a great pick. I think he will be a good fantasy football player for you. But drafting him at the turn ahead of guys like Jonathan Taylor, even Saquon, who I, you know I'm not that high on, taking him above those guys, taking him at the very top of that like second wide receiver tier, to me, is crazy, all right? He's obviously not proven it as an NFL player. He's been good. He's been a good route runner. He's, you know, top 900 yards twice in a row in an absolutely anemic offense where he's getting uncatchable targets. I understand that. My issue is like the Falcons are are paper champions right now. Everybody just assumes all of these moving puzzle pieces are going to fit perfectly. Everyone also assumes like Kirk Cousins, we have this recency bias towards what Kirk Cousins did last year in the first eight games of the season. He was throwing the ball like 40 times a game. And I think now that we saw that, we're just assuming that Kirk Cousins is this wildly high volume passing quarterback because of the eight games in last year when the Vikings had a terrible defense and needed to throw the ball a million times over. What is more likely in Atlanta this year? They're going to run the offense through a 36-year-old quarterback coming off a torn Achilles. No one's talking about the torn Achilles, by the way, either. Like, No one's actually factoring that into anything, I feel like, in Atlanta. It's just all systems go for him. What is more likely? Them running it through him in a brand new offense with a brand new uh, weapons group with a brand new coach and system and scheme and all this shit or through their 22-year-old top 10 pick running back. I know everyone thinks there's going to be such a high volume passing offense. We don't really even have the weapons to support that. We have Drake London and we have Kyle Pitts. I don't even I don't I'm not sold that Kyle Pitts is even a good NFL player, to be honest with you. So I, I think the entire offense is going to run through Bijan Robinson is going to run through even Tyler Algier will probably get a decent amount of work. The, the Drake London ADP is crazy to me. 14th overall pick, 15th overall pick. I can't get on board with it. I think he'll be a good fantasy football player. I don't think he's necessarily going to lose you your league or anything, but where you're taking him, you need him to be a fantasy breaking type player. Okay. So I'll echo this again. If late second, third round pick, fine with it. If you're taking him at the one, two turn, you will be making a mistake. Next up, we got Jamo Williams, Detroit Lions wide receiver. I really have nothing against Jameson Williams. Everything this offseason has been really, really positive. The reports out of camp have been really, really positive for him. Uh, they have no competition at the wide receiver three, four, five spot for him either. This is going to be a run first offense. Their defense has really improved. So I don't think they're going to have to take a ton of shots downfield. I don't think they're going to have to really ever play in catch up mode. But more realistically, the reason I don't take a lot of Jamison Williams is because when you look at all the picks around him, when you look at the ADP, the three guys ahead of Jamison Williams are James Conner, Aaron Jones, Ramondre Stevenson, the guys right underneath him, Najee Harris, Jake Ferguson, Jordan Addison, Jalen Warren. So when I try to think of this from a practical team building or a practical statistical point of view, what I see is this, like look at James Conner, Aaron Jones, Najee Harris, Jalen Warren. 
even, even Zamir White down there. If any of those running backs went over 1,000 yards from scrimmage, caught 40 passes, scored seven to eight touchdowns, I think that would be almost, that's almost expected of those guys. If Jamison Williams were to, were to top 1,000 receiving yards and score seven to eight touchdowns, that would be considered an incredibly like massive breakout year for Jameson Williams, considering he's done almost nothing up to this point. So I think because, again, on underdog, wide receivers get pushed up the board pretty dramatically because you start three of them, and then you have a flex. So realistically, you could start four of them. So you could draft you know seven or eight, and it just takes the four best each week. And I get it. It makes sense. But like when you look at guys that could potentially be – you know, RB1s, top 10, top 12 guys relative to Jamison Williams, whose ceiling is probably capped at like wide receiver 25. I don't even think there's an argument to make on the opposite side of this. So like, again, I don't have anything against Jamison Williams. Like maybe in your home league, he drops like the 12th, 13th, 14th round. Totally fine with that. But I'm not taking him above these, you know, workhorse running backs in offenses that I think could score a lot of points. Number 10, this is probably the guy I'm most nervous having on this list. And it is Romeo Dobbs of the Green Bay Packers. Dobbs is someone I probably need to be drafting a little bit more of. Uh, he's just seemingly the most boring pick in that Packers receiver group, although it does seem like he's probably going to run the most routes and, and have the most snaps and perform pretty well again. I just find myself drafting guys like Brian Robinson Jr. ahead of him who's going behind him and 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 players like that more often, but I, I don't feel great about having 0% exposure to Romeo Dobbs if I'm, if I'm being uh, completely honest with you here but I do feel great about having zero percent exposure to Gabe Davis just because I want nothing to do with uh with big Gabe he's gonna run a lot of routes this year and he's gonna have a lot of playing time but I one I just don't think he's that good of a player and two I think he's gonna fall behind Brian Thomas Jr. in the pecking order for targets very very quickly so I don't really want the what I think would be the fifth option in this offense behind Kirk BTJ, Evan Ingram, Travis Etienne here. So I'm I'm fine not having Gabe. Obviously, I'm going to miss out on some some pretty big weeks, I'm assuming. But like overall, Gabe Davis is not a dude that I'm kicking myself for not having. And I tweeted this list out. As we get to the tight ends, the player I got the most pushback on for sure was having 0% Brock Bowers. Everybody's like, he's a generational tight end, all this shit, all that shit. I don't give a fuck. You have a rookie tight end who is splitting snaps with a top 35 pick tight end from a year ago with a bottom 10 quarterback in the NFL. This is going to be a slow run first, defensive first, low upside offense with a bona fide superstar wide receiver and a really good wide receiver too in Jacoby Myers. Like I get the appeal of the upside and talent and how they're going to use them all over the formation. It's just not for me in 2024. I, if I miss out on him this year, I am fine because he's going you're picking between Njoku and Brock Bowers, and there are guys like Goddard and Pat Fryermuth who I would take above Brock Bowers. I just don't think people are being practical about the situation and him being a rookie tight end, splitting snaps in a, a low passing offense. Like, how many fucking passing touchdowns is Garner Minshew and Aiden O'Connell going to throw for this year? If Vegas had lines on it right now, the, the combination of those two, it wouldn't be higher than like, like Bo Nix is at 16 and a half for the year, okay? Those two together wouldn't be much higher. They'd probably be at like 17 and a half or 18 and a half. Now you're splitting that between probably the single best goal line red zone pass catcher in the NFL in Devontae Adams. You're splitting that with Jacoby Myers. You're splitting that with uh, Zamir White on the goal line. You're splitting that with Michael Mayer, who is a very big, good pass catching tight end in contested situations. Like Brock Bauer is probably going to score like three or four touchdowns this year. Okay. I'm, I'm good on that. I'm finna pass. I'm finna pass the blunt to Ben Sinat or Ben Sinnott, however you say his name. Benson is the other one, the last one on this list that I have a 0% exposure to. He started the summer as like the tight end 18 in underdog drafts. And I get it. A lot of like rookie people and, and dynasty people per se are the ones that go right into underdog. And they're the ones that set up the ADP from the beginning. But this is one of the most egregious ADPs I've seen in a long time. He has moved significantly down the board. Uh, but here's the thing. Like, I know no one wants to hear this. Zach Ertz is probably going to be the top pass catching tight end in this offense. I don't care what Ben Sinnott did in week one of the preseason against backup defensive players without the starting lineup in Washington. That means nothing to me. Zach Ertz is probably going to be the top pass catcher at the tight end position in this offense. Do you remember when Zach Ertz was in Arizona playing over Trey McBride? Do you remember who the fucking dude calling the plays was? Yeah, it was Cliff Kingsbury. Do you know who's in Washington? Cliff Kingsbury. He brought Zach Ertz over to annoy the fuck out of us with another talented rookie tight end. Ben Sinat's going to catch 34 balls for 311 yards and score two touchdowns. You want that on your fantasy team? I'm proud of you. I'm happy for you. It ain't going to be me, though. 
And those are the 13 players that I have 0% exposure to. I know you guys are going to yell at me in the comments, so I can't wait to see how I'm wrong. And everybody on here is a generational talent, and everybody here is, uh, is a league winner in fantasy football this year. My favorite time of the year, when everything I say is wrong and everything you say is right. And it's just, you know, it's beautiful. It's summer, and it's time for me to say goodbye and give you smoochies. Mwah.